Let's get started this morning um, with, with uh, our next class in the series of Two Truths and a Lie. Uh, we are going to continue looking at uh, different ethical systems, the way, you know, what people build up to use to determine what is right and what is wrong. Uh, today we're going to look at one that's called moral relativism, in case uh, any of you have ever heard of that before. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Last week we met, we, we talked about deontism, and we talked about how deontism is the belief that certain things are right or wrong no matter what the outcome. So it doesn't matter if we're helping more amounts of people or if we're doing something for this person versus this person, it doesn't matter. There are certain things that are just right and wrong no matter what. Um, and hopefully, at, at the end of it, what I was hoping to get across to is that that is, it's a great system until something affects you, and you have a moral dilemma, and you have to decide, do I still believe this is right or wrong no matter what the outcome? Uh, especially if it comes to harm to yourself or the, the, the loss of your own life, and you have to decide, Am I willing to sacrifice my own life for this belief? I believe this so much that I'm not going to compromise. This is right or wrong. I don't care if I die in this situation. So that when we think deontism, that's what we're thinking is no matter what the outcome, this is right or wrong. And, and I'm going to stick with, with this. So Today we're going to look at a, another one. Uh, we're going to look at moral relativism. But before we do that, let's go ahead and play our uh, this this week's game of two truths and a lie. So I am going to give you several lists. These are brought to you by thetoptens.com. I'm going to give you uh, several lists of three items. One of these is the lie. So you have to sniff that out as we as we kind of go along. All right. So this one. The first one is, what are the top 10 animals? Top 10 animals, all right? Number one would be the penguin. Number two, the panda. Or number three, the dog. All right, we're looking for the top 10. Okay, how many think that the lie is the penguin in the top 10? How many think the panda is the lie that's in the top 10? How many of you think the dog is the lie in the top 10? And some people didn't raise their hands. Okay. The lie is the panda. The dog is number one. Penguin is number six on the list. And panda is number 12. It did not make our top 10. All right. Okay. Now that you've got one under your belt. Top 10 things we learned in school that are now useless. So which of these did not make the top 10? Number one, I before E except after C. Number two, cursive writing. Number three, how to climb a rope. So which of those is a lie in the top 10 things we learned in school that are now useless? How many of you think it's I before E except after C is the lie? How many of you think is cursive writing, and how many of you think how to climb a rope, which is now useless, okay? In people's answers, I'm actually the one that came up with I before E except after C. That was not in the list, so apparently either we didn't think of it or we still use it quite a bit, so good for us. Number, the next one, the top 10 countries with the best food. Top 10 countries with the best food. Now, which of these is the lie? Is it France, Mexico, or Germany? So remember, this is top 10 countries with the best food. How many of you think the lie is France? How many of you think the lie is Mexico? And how many of you think the lie is Germany? Okay, France came in number two, Mexico number three, and Germany was number 12 on the list here. All right, next one is top 10 websites. Top 10 websites. 
So which of these is the lie? We've got Wikipedia, we've got Instagram, and we have Amazon. So Wikipedia, Instagram, and Amazon. Which one of those is not in the top 10 of websites? How many think the lie is Wikipedia? How many think the lie is Instagram? And how many think the lie is Amazon? Everybody shoppers here, okay. So actually we've got Wikipedia coming in at number four, Amazon at number six, and Instagram number 25. All right, and the last question for today, the top 10 most dangerous sports. Top 10 most dangerous sports. All right, so which one of these is the lie? Is it wrestling, cheerleading, or rugby? So those are, are some answers. Which one of those is not in the top 10? Is it wrestling, cheerleading, or rugby? How many think wrestling did not make the top 10 most dangerous? How many think cheerleading did not make the top 10? And how many think rugby did not make the top 10? Okay, so actually in this list, wrestling was number 11. It did not make the top 10. Cheerleading took number three. <laughs> Where do these people cheerlead? Um, I guess the, in, in a concrete building or something. Uh, and rugby was number eight. So cheerleading was actually higher up there. All right. Did you notice anything about the questions that I asked this week that might have been a little different than the way we've asked them before? Did they feel completely fair? Or did it feel maybe a little bit like the answers might change based upon the group of people that we asked? Okay, that's why I chose those particular questions because would everyone answer the same way when asked, what are the top 10 best animals? Well, your house might answer differently than mine. Um, or countries with the best food. How would, how would different groups of people answer that one? If we went to another country, would it be the same or would it be different? Welcome to the wonderful world of moral relativism. All right, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Moral relativists believe there is no objective morality. Each person gets to make up their own mind about what is right and what is wrong. So you decide for you what is right and what is wrong, and I decide for me what is right and what is wrong. That is moral, uh, moral relativism. Uh, they work their way from situation to situation, making judgment calls about each one. So I might have a situation today, and I might make a judgment call on it, and then tomorrow, who knows what the circumstance might be, it might even change a little bit, but according even to the situation, I might change my stance on something. So moral relativism. Now, let's discuss that a little bit. What would it look like to live in a society of moral relativism? What would it look like to live in a society of moral relativism? Is there anything good you can think about that would come with that or anything bad? So let's think about that. You have your system of what's right and wrong, and I have my system of what's right and wrong. What would it be like to live in that society? Okay, okay. I think that's an accurate uh, thought. Absolutely. Aren't we living in that right now, he said. What do you think? What does it look like? Anything good, anything bad? Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. And, and actually, that's a, a great point. Uh, I think his name was Jean-Paul... I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but S-A-R-T-R-E-S. Um, Sartre, I suppose, something like that. 
was a moral relativist, but he was also an atheist. He was probably one of the, the, the best known philosophers that believed in moral relativism. And he would draw a line and say, all right, which line is longer? And everyone would say, what do you mean? There's only one line. And he would say, exactly. When it comes to you and me, there's, there's my thought. And if there's no God, then there's nothing to compare anything to. So who gets to make the, the moral choice? Me. And so a, a lot of moral relativists are atheists um, because they say there's nothing to compare to, so I'm going to make my own choices of what is right and what is wrong. Other thoughts on moral relativism? Good or bad? Okay. Okay, so maybe hanging around others with different ideas and different thoughts could be good. I don't know. What do you think? Good or bad? Any other thoughts on moral relativism? Okay, okay. So we again come to the moral dilemma part, but whenever two different, uh, whenever the consequences of your decision affect me somehow. Okay, good. Good, good. Okay. So there's also something, you know, kind of like a family, or even in a church, there are certain things that we don't always agree on, uh, but we can compromise, you know, and there is some sort of give and take. Now, obviously, I do believe that there are some moral absolutes, but when it comes to just the good, there is some give and take. Okay. Okay. So the, the being able to look at others and have an acceptance, right, of a, a, different, a different opinion or a different thought uh, might be something that, that could be considered a good thing that would come out of that. Um, and so we, we, should, we should probably think through that as well. What are the good and the bad of moral relativism? How does that work um, if you have your own system and I have my own? And we start to think about, you know, different biblical uh, different scriptures and look through it, and when we, we start to really think about it, you might think, someone might come to you and say, well, you know, the Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, right? You need to listen to others' opinions. You need to be slow to speak. You need to allow others to say their piece. You need to allow others to, to kind of do their thing. Um, and, and this is where we, it begins to get tricky because we do have to make sure that we're taking Scripture in the way Scripture is meant to be taken. So what do you think? Do you think we need to shut up and be more tolerant? Or am I getting too personal somewhere here? Okay. Okay. We can listen. It doesn't mean we have to agree. Any other thoughts? We can listen, but we don't have to agree. Um, at, at we've kind of mentioned this a little bit before, but tolerance has now become a virtue that is held higher than truth. Tolerance has now become a virtue that is held higher than truth. We kind of talked about happiness being the same way. Now, before we go and start a war about intolerance, let me also say this. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 that we've read before contains other virtues that are closely associated with the current definition of tolerance. 
whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, if you're arguing with someone and you're thinking, I've won this argument, this other person's thoughts are just stupid. Well, that doesn't sound very pure or lovely, does it? Does that sound admirable to you? Now, so we, have to, we, ha- we do have to keep in mind our thought process as we think about others that might have moral relativism as their main way of thinking. Um, notice the actual words of the passage we read in James. Be slow to speak, slow to become angry. What, is the ac- what do the actual words say? Notice it does not say, never speak and never become angry. It does not say that. It says, be slow to speak and slow to become angry. There is a place for becoming upset about things. There is a place for speaking and saying, this is the right thing. We see that in the Bible. Uh, In fact, we're going to look at some examples here in a little bit. But there are examples of times when people let things play out. They let people make bad decisions. And then there's other times when they spoke up and they said, what you're doing is not right. What you're doing is wrong. And so let's, let's make sure that as we're thinking about how to react to moral relativism, that we're doing it correctly. We should be slow to speak and slow to become angry. We should allow people to talk. We should allow people to share. But we need to make sure we're doing it in a way um, that will not close off a relationship Uh, a way that will not bar any further conversation. Um, If we keep reading uh, the, the, the passage that we talked about, the best way to speak out about the right way to live is not so much actually by your words, but by your action. If you keep reading James, what's the whole book about? Don't just let people know you're a Christian by the words you speak but by the way you live. And so we need to remember that as we, as we kind of work through these, these issues and these things. If you want others to respect your moral thoughts, have a meal with someone that thinks differently than you. If you want someone to respect your moral thoughts, take care of people that have done nothing to deserve your care. If you want others to respect your moral thoughts, Wash someone's feet and then serve them dinner and clean up afterwards. And maybe then we'll be qualified to teach on morality. Because the Bible tells us we don't just say it, we live it. And if you live a servant lifestyle, and obviously Jesus is our ultimate example, we can go out and we can say, this is right, this is wrong. But we have to be careful that our actions are in alignment with our words. Now, since we look at uh, the life of our master Jesus, let's continue in context. Jesus did all of these things, and many people love him and respect his teaching on morality because of his actions. But where did his life end up? Where did his life end up? On a cross, right? we have to be willing to accept that even though we serve people, even though we do our best, even though we love people, it doesn't always mean that our life ends up the best whenever we are sharing our moral thoughts and our thoughts on ethics and what is right and what is wrong. Jesus was a great master, respected by many. Early in his ministry, what happened? He was followed by thousands of people. And so we like that part of Jesus' life, right? I'm going to follow that Jesus. I'm going to follow that Jesus, and I'm going to stand in front of people, and I'm going to talk about Jesus' things, and there's going to be thousands of people that will follow and like. And wait, is that sounding like something we've talked about before, the problem of social media? We want to be social, we want to be social media followers of Jesus. I want lots of followers, lots of likes, because I'm teaching this but we don't want to be the end part of Jesus' life followers, the part where you have to go to the cross. What we have to realize is 
when we, we want to absolutely do our very best to serve, to be servants, um, to, to follow Jesus in, in a great way that, that is a great impact on others, but people will also turn on you in a second. You can serve people and love people all you want, and, and, and I'm not saying we go looking for this. I'm just saying as Christians, we need to be ready for it. And then the moment that you go to the king who has taken another wife, and you say, you're doing wrong, then what happens? Off with his head. So we have to be understanding that that may be where we follow Jesus to. And, and that's something we should be thinking about as we think about speaking with people that have a different belief system that we do. Okay, a few quick thoughts on the principle of moral relativism. Now, if you follow this ethic, you must be consistent. That's what we're trying to talk about with all of these different things, right? If you're going to be a utilitarian, what works best for the most amount of people, you stick with that, right? So, if what works best for the most amount of people doesn't work for you, be honest, stick with your, with your ethic. If you are a deontist and you say, I don't care, there's things that are right and wrong no matter what, but then it comes to your doorstep, are you going to stick with that? Same thing with moral relativism. If you follow this ethic, can you be consistent? If you really believe each person decides their own morals, let's follow that through logically, what does that mean? Do you have a right to tell anybody anything about their thoughts? Do you have a right to have an opinion on anything outside of your own life? No. If you follow moral relativism to its natural conclusion, if your child comes up to my doorstep in a few weeks and I decide to slip some rat poison into their candy box, I have every right to do that because that's my right and wrong and not yours. So we have to be really careful with moral relativism. Um, you can't really follow through with that and, and it be something that we can consistently say because everybody also wants to have an opinion, right? The real problem is that people want to go their own way. I want to, I want to have my own right and wrong. Um, but I want you to have a certain specific set of things that are right and wrong. Now, that's not consistent. We have to be consistent in not only the way we live, but the way we view others, the way we view the world at large. We have to think critically about what this means. Now, can you think of any biblical examples that might show some moral relativism in a good or a bad light? So can you think, just think through some, maybe some Bible stories. Can you think of any stories where people were kind of like, well, we, we, we have a certain way of believing. We, we believe this. I believe this, and this is kind of the way I think things should be, and you can do your thing, but I believe this. Any things you can think about in the Bible? Zacchaeus. Okay, tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, okay, okay. So he wasn't going along with the, 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 the day, what was happening that day, the current of, uh, events, basically, is what you're saying, okay? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay, okay. Meaning they're kind of, they had a different thought process. Okay. Yeah, but they have a moral dilemma with that. Okay. And they tried to go a different way, but they were going to really burden somebody okay. by what they believed, and, and so they were really much punished because they didn't accept the moral choice. Okay, okay. They didn't bow down to it. Right, yes. They did not bow down when other people 
uh, did it, they said, we've got this certain other, other code of ethics, another way of, of doing things. Daniel, okay, okay. 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 Daniel. Any other thoughts? Okay, okay. He flip-flopped pretty quick on, on a few different things, right? And, and here's, here's the beauty of this whole thing. Let's remember something very important. We can look at the bad parts of biblical characters, but then let's also remember that Abraham is a hero of the faith. So that's not to say that we can't ever make a mistake. Uh, we can't ever, you know, have something where oh my goodness, I've got this moral failure that's just, and, and, and this is, and I won't get into the weeds with cancel culture and all that, but what drives me nuts on cancel culture is you ever make a mistake and then all of a sudden you can't be uh, someone who is doing a radio show or a TV show or whatever, and I just want to go, I, I want to talk, I want to do a poll of everybody that, that that's come from and say, so if I follow you into your past, would you never have something that you we're embarrassed about or made a mistake on or whatever. And, and I'm not saying again that we give everybody the mic and let everybody be up front. I'm just saying sometimes it's crazy when we look at things and we look at context and people get so upset about someone making a mistake. And I think this is where Christians can actually step up and step forward and say, hey, we've got something really cool to offer. It's called forgiveness and grace. And so we, we, when we remember all of these stories of people having moral failures, let's also remember there's forgiveness and there's grace. And so we're digging up people's past, we're digging up the bad stuff, but let's also remember that part as well. But let's look at a story in Acts chapter 17, because I want to show you, um, I think, a, a story that really highlights uh, moral relativism really, really well. It's Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16. So it says this, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Now, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? And others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. And God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. 
Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day where he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. And when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council, and a few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the context here. Epicurean philosophy, uh, there were some Epicurean and Stoic uh, philosophers that were there. Epicurean philosophy is largely hedonistic, meaning the highest virtue is pleasure. Do what makes you happy. And we've kind of talked about that a little bit. Okay, so do what makes you happy. Now, to be fair, uh, the one who, who designed all of this, this philosophy and this thought process also said, you should be careful not to overindulge because when you overindulge in something that makes you happy, it actually can make you miserable. So follow that logic. You know, I love cake. I eat too much of it, and how do I feel the next day? Oh, I don't feel good at all. Um, or whatever the case, whatever the vice might be. I like this, but if I do it too much, I also have to be careful because it might, it might not lend to my joy or my happiness if I do it too much. So this is the world of Epicurean um, thought. Do what makes you happy. Life is, you only live for a while and then you're dead. And when you're dead, you're dead like Rover, you're dead all over, okay? So you're dead, there's no more coming back, so let's live for the moment, let's enjoy. That's Epicureanism. Um, so the Epicureans had gathered to debate against the Stoics. Now, the Stoics believed a lot like what their name sounds like. Um, you should be strong of will so that you can be indifferent to emotions and to pain. So I should be able to sit here and focus my thoughts so hard that whatever is happening around me will not affect me. That's, that's what the Stoics believed. So I should have something internally that is driving me to not be affected by the things around me. I should be able to control my emotions and my thoughts and put them all under, under control. There, you, you should be in control of yourself and deny yourself so that you can think yourself into a certain state of mind. Um, so that you won't go crazy in life. So you've got the Epicurean saying, no way. Once you're dead, you're gone, so you might as well eat, drink, and enjoy life. For tomorrow we die. And then you have the Stoic saying, no, you should control yourself. Into this walks Paul, who walks in with a new idea. Maybe your belief system and what is right and wrong has nothing to do with you. Maybe there's a God that created all men and put them in certain times and places in all of life so that they would seek him. And he's the one that determines what is right and what is wrong. That's where he comes into. So Christianity was a very different idea for them. To have someone come in and say, you know, maybe it's not just you who decides what's right and wrong or this discussion with other people. Maybe it's God. Who decides this so a very interesting story here that we kind of see some moral relativism to the point of him walking in and they worshiped you know what we don't know what's right and wrong so let's just worship everything including this unknown God over here and then he comes in and says no there actually is such a thing as absolute truth there is a God that created people all people and wants them to seek him so a very different thought process for them. So moral relativism, what's right for me is right for me, not necessarily right for you. And some people might say, well, what about the whole listen to your heart thing? Well, we should, I mean, it's in all the Disney movies, right? My kids watch the Disney movies. Oh, just listen to your heart, and your heart will tell you the right thing, the right way to go. What does the Bible say about your heart? Have you ever read 
I would encourage you to just type in, get your app up on your Bible app and type in heart and see how many different things come up. Here's some of them. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Not listen to it, but guard it. In other words, what? Be careful what's coming in. Be careful what's coming in. Guard your heart, for everything you do flows out of that. What about Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9? The heart is deceitful above all things and is beyond cure. Who can understand it? The heart is deceitful. So when people say, I just want to listen to my heart, I just know in my heart this is the right thing. Did you ever think that maybe your heart could be bad? Just as your heart physically can become bad, could your heart spiritually or emotionally become bad? Could there be something broken with that that part of you that says, I think this is right and this is wrong? Or is that part always absolutely perfect 100% of the time? The heart is deceitful above all things. What about Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27? I, talking about the Lord saying this, will give you a new heart and put a new spirit inside of you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. I will put a new heart inside of you and I'll give you my spirit to help guide you. We, we think that truth comes from within. And God says, I will give you a new heart and a counselor to help guide you. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. So where do we get our system of ethics. Where do we get what's right and wrong? Do we listen to our heart? Do we say, I have the ability to make the right and wrong decisions for myself? Or do we say, whatever works the best for the most amount of people must be the right thing to do? Or do we say, no, there are things that are right and wrong no matter what the outcome? Okay, so we've looked at a couple of different ways of of ethics, and and I want us to start thinking about, I don't want to get too much into it because we're going to get into it more down the road. We're going to get more practical. How do you, how, how do we have a fair conversation about this with others? Uh, But I think in moral relativism, some of the things we, we need to do is to stop going from thing to thing to thing to make the decision and make the decision before the things happen that these are some principles that are going to help us guide us throughout life. Isn't that what we're trying to do is to have principles that will guide us throughout life no matter what comes so that whenever something comes we're not caught going what's my decision? When something comes we should say I think I already have an idea of what to do because I know the one who has the right answers for me. Now that's not to say that everything will always be clear cut in life, because it will not. We will have moral dilemmas. Uh, But where do we turn? Again, inside, or do we go somewhere else to figure out what the right answer is? All right, so we'll talk more about that. We'll talk about Jesus and what he said about truth in coming weeks, and then we'll get into what happens whenever these things are in your home, or how do you speak to others about that? How do we be Uh, what are some practical things that we can do? Appreciate your thoughts this morning.